and how that interacted with his public life. Traditional biographies tend to focus on the significant achievements of exceptional people, and Richard will do that later on when he talks about Einstein's theories of relativity. However, my interest is not just in Einstein's contribution to science, which was without doubt considerable, and of course the reason why we're here tonight anyway, but also the circumstances in which he produced his work. What I want to look at is not only what he achieved, but also the social and political environment in which he studied and worked. British sociologist Liz Stanley argues that any good biography worthy of the name should firmly grasp the cup of plenty that is a person's life. What that means is all aspects of a life should be considered, including what may at first glance seem to be incidental to the life that was lived. Is the fact that Einstein was Jewish irrelevant to any story of his life? Definitely not. He was born in 1879, the year that the term anti-Semitism was first coined by Wilhelm Ma. And some biographers claim that his Jewishness was the major cause of Einstein's long wait for the Nobel Prize. After being rejected eight times, Einstein finally got the prize for his contribution to theoretical physics. In 1922, not for the general theory of relativity, the special theory of relativity, but for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. But more of that later. Biographies are very popular, a result perhaps of what has been called the gossip factor. But readers should bear in mind that the picture of the person that emerges depends on the interests of the biographer, their relationship to the subject, and the range of source material available. Hundreds of books have been written about Einstein, and some, especially the earlier ones, present sanitised versions of him. Einstein's executors managed to prevent the publication of a book about him by his elder son, Hans Albert, presumably because it tarnished the saintly picture they were keen to promote. Little mention is made in early biographies about the relationship between Einstein, his wives, he had one after the other, two wives in all, in all his sons and his stepdaughters. One glaring omission until more recently is the birth of a daughter out of wedlock to Einstein and his first wife, Mileva Marek. This information became available when Mileva's letters entered the public domain in the 1980s. A different picture of Einstein may emerge once again, once the letters between him and his elder son and those between him and his second wife, Elsa, also become available for public scrutiny. Does exposing negative aspects of Einstein's character minimise the significance of his contribution to science and to humanity? I firmly don't believe so. Biographer Dennis Bryan, like me, favours a more warts and all approach, claiming that revealing Einstein as a far more compelling, complicated and controversial individual than previously thought, still in all his glory, but with his halo slightly askew, makes him an even more endearing subject. So, I could tell Einstein's story by focusing on different roles or different aspects of his identity. Einstein the socialist, the pacifist, the Zionist, the father, the husband, the friend, and each would reveal particular facets of his personality. But unfortunately, we don't have all night. So, a little of his family and educational background will have to do. A brief summary of some of the circumstances that led up to 1905, Annus Mirabilis, the year of miracles, in which he published five scientific papers while working at the patent office in Bern, Switzerland. So, if you're sitting comfortably, let's begin. Albert Einstein was born on the 14th of March, 1879. He was a late developer, not talking until the age of two or three, depending on which biography you read and on Einstein's own version of events. 
The story has it that when he did start to talk, he talked in sentences. He didn't start with one word at a time. His parents were initially concerned that he was perhaps a little backward and slow thinking because of this, but presumably they later changed their minds. <laughs> Einstein attended a Catholic primary school and he was not happy there. In later life, he had this to say about education. To me, the worst thing seems to be for a school principally to work with methods of fear, force and artificial authority. Such treatment destroys the sound sentiments, the sincerity and the self-confidence of the pupil. It produces the submissive subject. Einstein was not thought brilliant by his teachers and his headmaster apparently said that he would never make a success of anything. The reason for his unhappiness and his teacher's assessment was that Einstein was unorthodox in his thinking and in the way that he worked. He didn't take a teacher's word for something without question. He appears to have been a critical thinker and challenged authority from a very early age. At home, Einstein was interested in solving puzzles. His parents appear to have been quite liberal in their approach to child rearing and gave him his head, allowing Einstein to develop his own interests. At the age of five, he was given a compass by his father, and he later credited this with developing his interest in the forces of nature. Einstein's German high school was strict and very formal. Reports say that the teachers were heavy-handed and impatient. His Greek master said he would never amount to anything, and he was considered by most of the teachers to be disrespectful. Some biographers argue that in terms of science, Einstein was largely self-educated, and this was possible because of support from his family. An uncle introduced him to algebra, and a medical student, Max Talmy, introduced him to popular science books, when a weekly dinner guest of the Einstein family. From the age of 12, science and philosophy became part of Einstein's life. He found the way science was taught at school boring, and I can empathise with that. He eventually dropped out for a year at age 16 and went to join his parents, who were by then living in Italy. After being turned down for tertiary education, Einstein attended a school in Switzerland that was much more to his liking. Wendler, the headmaster with whom Einstein was a boarder, was also liberal in his approach to learning and a free thinker. And this suited Einstein much better. At this school, Einstein appears to have been liked by both pupils and teachers. And after gaining his diploma, he decided on a teaching course. At Zurich University, his lecturers were extremely irritated by Einstein for failing to attend lectures and doing his own thing. One described him as a lazy dog who never bothered with maths at all. Einstein did neglect maths because of what he saw as over-specialisation. At the time, he reasoned that he didn't have time to learn everything. It was only later that he realised his mistake. His wife, Mileva, who had been in his class at university, helped him with his mathematics in the early years of their marriage. Later, he enlisted the help of friends. Einstein's teachers, this is a similar story, thought him arrogant, rebellious, and outspoken. One professor told him, you're a clever fellow, Einstein, but you have one fault. You won't let anyone tell you a thing. Einstein himself thought that the lecturers were too limited in their thinking and out of touch with the most recent scientific theories and research. Michael White and John Gribben, in their biography of Einstein, suggest that this so-called arrogance can be given a different, more positive interpretation. They suggest that Einstein knew best what worked for him and he had confidence in his own approach. Instead of being viewed negatively, as it was at the time, Einstein's method could, they argue, be described as showing maturity and self-awareness rather than arrogance or disrespect. Nevertheless, after passing his exams, 
by cramming a friend's lecture notes, because he hadn't been to the lectures, Einstein found it impossible to get a university job after getting his diploma. Several reasons for this have been put forward, but the general consensus seems to be that it was a combination of anti-Semitism and his poor relations with teachers.